Good evening. Welcome to the Yale Law School Faculty Book Talk Series. It's great to see such a terrific turnout this evening. This evening's book talk, uh, I'm Teresa Miguel Stearns. I'm your law librarian. Welcome. This evening's book talk features Professors Daniel Markovitz and Professor Samuel Moyne in a discussion of Professor Markovitz's book, The Meritocracy Trap, How America's Foundational Myth Feeds Inequality, Dismantles the Middle Class, and Devours the Elite. I'm going to provide very brief introductions uh, and then turn it over to Professors Markovitz and Moyne. Professor Markovitz is the Guido Calabresi Professor of Law here at Yale Law School. He works in the philosophical foundations of, of private law, moral and political philosophy, and behavioral economics. He has written articles and books on contracts, legal ethics, distributive justice, democratic theory, and other regarding preferences. After earning a bachelor's degree in mathematics, Professor Markovitz was a Marshall Scholar and earned graduate degrees in econometrics and mathematical uh, economics from the London School of Economics. He also earned a ma master's and doctoral degrees in philosophy from the University of Oxford. Professor Markovitz then returned to Yale Law School, studied law, and after clerking for the Honorable Guido Calabresi, joined the faculty here at Yale Law School in 2001. Providing commentary this evening is Professor Samuel Moyne, Henry R. Luce, Professor of Jurisprudence here at Yale Law School, and Professor of History at Yale University. After earning his bachelor's degree from Washington University in St. Louis, he received his PhD in modern European, uh, modern European history from the University of California, Berkeley, and his law degree from Harvard Law School. Professor Moyne's legal scholarship, which includes several books and many articles, focuses on international law, human rights, the law of war, and legal thought in both historical and current perspectives. Before joining the faculty here at Yale Law School in 2017, he was the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law and Professor of History at Harvard. He began his teaching career at Columbia University, where he taught for 13 years in the History Department, ending as Bryce Professor of European Legal History. Please join me in welcoming Professors Moyne and Professor Markovitz for tonight's book talk. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, I essentially get the privileges of starting out the questioning. Uh, and I'll try not to be selfish and take up the whole time and leave you a chance to ask some questions, too. Now, normally, when many of us present in this series, it's, it's sort of the most attention a book might get. But that's not what's going on tonight. Uh, this book, uh, The Meritocracy Trap, in the space of not very long, has come to occupy something close to the center of a big and continuing national debate about our present discontents. And so a lot's at stake in whether it's right or wrong and in what its moral argument is. Uh, so we have the benefit, I have since I've been following it uh, very closely, of witnessing the reception. Uh, and what I'll try to do is organize some of the questions around the criticisms that the book has received, fairly or sometimes unfairly, uh, and then we can have a general conversation. So uh, what I would say is there's, there's a, a, a portrait in this book, uh, and there's a moral assessment of the new reality you say has come into being. So let's start with the first, the, the descriptive part of the book. Uh, which I read basically as a story of, of transition from one mode of elite preferment and self-reproduction to a new one. Uh, so would you just tell us, however you know, briefly you can, uh, what, what that change was uh, and where we are now in, 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 in the rise of this thing you call meritocracy? Great. First of all, thank you, Teresa, for letting me do this. Thank you, Sam. Um, you know, uh, it, it is, you guys haven't seen how much Sam has engaged with this book and how incredibly helpfully and incisively. It's hard to imagine uh, a more generous but also sharp and incisive interlocutor. And uh, I don't know how you managed to do this for so many books. <laughs> Um, it's, it's astonishing. I'm and, on leave right now. Yeah, nevertheless. Nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I sort of uh, wanted people to know that, so now some people know that. Uh, it's amazing. It's just amazing. Um, in answer to the question, so the old elite, 
was effectively an aristocratic elite. Even after formal titles of aristocracy had been abandoned or fallen into disuse or disrepute, it remained the case that the people on top of the social and economic order largely were there based on their breeding. They had directly inherited their privilege. And their wealth was held in the form of physical or financial capital, so land, factories, portfolios of stocks. And they themselves did not work very much. In fact, they constituted themselves as a leisure class. So through 1900, you could tell how poor somebody was by how hard they worked. And the rich did not work. And even into the 1950s, elites worked much shorter hours than middle class for a variety of reasons, including because of a good faith desire to break up this old elite, which was viewed as sclerotic, as inefficient, and as deeply unjust, people at various critical points in the US American system began to embrace the idea that people should get ahead not based on their breeding, but based on their own accomplishments. There should be ways of measuring accomplishments, and people should be promoted based on how they fare under these measurements. And this was an extremely effective way of breaking up the old elite, largely because the old elite, being an aristocratic leisure class, lacked both the talent and the taste for work or for training its children. So at this university, King and Brewster became president in the 1960s, hired Inky Clark to be his dean of admissions, fired the entire admissions staff, and within five or six years, transformed the Yale class so that by 1970, the SAT scores of the median student would have been in the top 10% of the class of 1960. The Yale class of 1970 had the highest grades of any Yale class in history. The share of public school kids was the highest in history. The share of legacy or alumni children was the lowest in history. And the elite was radically opened up based on meritocracy and measures of accomplishment. But that new elite that was formed by meritocracy knows how to train its children, and has tastes for training and labor that are unmatched anywhere else in the system, and now trains the next generation of its children in a way that nobody in the middle class can match. And so meritocracy, which had become, which was adopted as an engine of opportunity, has become a block to opportunity, as middle class and working class kids can't compete with the education that rich parents provide for their children. And in a second movement, this new, hard-working, hyper-trained elite, a superordinate working class, draws technology towards it to remake the labor market and the way in which things are made and services are produced to favor precisely its skill, to eliminate mid-skill jobs from the economy, to suppress middle-class wages, and to polarize the labor market into a narrow elite of superordinate workers who get enormous wages and a large rump of workers who are subordinated get low wages, have little dignity, few opportunities for advancement, little workplace training. And then, of course, these mechanisms of extravagant training among elite families and the polarization of the labor market in response to superordinate workers feed back into each other and snowball and produce the system that we have today. OK, so I'm sold that there, there's some new ruling class and uh, it gets where it gets through so-called meritocratic uh, advancement, and it works really hard, maybe harder than others, although we should get back to that. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, it entrenches its ascendancy uh, by then not giving money to the children, but by training them up to compete in the next generational round. So one a criticism I've seen is that it's not that this picture isn't true. It is true. It describes a lot. It's going to describe a lot of the people in this room. But maybe you've, you've overemphasized how big a part in the general picture of class rule that this meritocratic ascendancy is. So let's just start at the top. Uh, so one, one critic worries that you pay attention to the 1% by, measured by income, but there's still lots of inherited wealth that's transferred intergenerationally. 
Uh, and then there, there's a creative class that is kind of hiring all the consultants and financiers and lawyers who got their ascendancy by dropping out uh, of college or <coughs> never going to law school uh, and creating lots of wealth. Uh, and so the, the, the general worry would be that there is this new meritocratic elite that runs through a, a Yale or you know kindred institutions, but the the picture of, of of class rule needs to accommodate all the other sources of wealth, including older inherited wealth and um, new ways of accumulating wealth that aren't exactly meritocratic. So, what do you say to that Great. argument about kind of misdescription at the top? Um, and so Sam has put that point rather more politely than some of the others who've written about this uh, in, in the press. Look, um, first of all, just to be clear, the conventional account of class focuses on two classes, capital and labor. And the account that I'm providing identifies three classes, capital, ordinary labor, middle class labor, and superordinate labor. And the criticism takes two kinds of forms. One form is just inside the data, which says that I am overemphasizing the effect of superordinate labor on rising inequality and underemphasizing the enduring effect of capital. And I'll say something about that in a moment. And the other is not inside the data so much, but rather has to do with the dynamics of conflict among these three groups which is to say it supposes that superordinate labor and capital are natural allies and will collectively exploit and suppress ordinary labor. So let me say something about each of those. Um, first, on the question, how important is capital versus superordinate labor? Um, partly there are questions about how you understand the data, and partly there are questions about how you understand the relevant categories. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it has found that over the past 60 years, there has been an aggregate shift of income in our society away from labor and in favor of capital, which peaked at an 8% shift and is now back down to a 6% shift. That number, for various technical reasons, almost certainly overestimates the shift, in particular because it underestimates the labor income of entrepreneurs and professionals who work as self-employed owners of pass-through businesses. So the law firms that you will all go work in. Let's suppose that we take the 6% number seriously. So there's been a 6% shift of income away from labor in aggregate and towards capital in aggregate. We know that the richest 1% of the society by wealth owns about a third of the wealth. The estimates vary from the 20% to the 40%. But let's say it's a third of the wealth. A third of six is two. The overall shift of income away from the middle class and towards the top 1% is 10% of national income. So the remaining 8% or 80% of the increase are attributable to redistribution within the labor share. So, so that's the story on the data of why I think the battle between superordinate labor and others is more important than the battle between labor and capital, which isn't to say that the battle between labor and capital is unimportant. It's a real effect. It's a consequential effect. And in some ways, it's a politically easy to criticize effect. Okay? Now, we could talk more about how to categorize things, but I don't want to talk for, for too long. On the question of the class conflict, um, it is true that often superordinate labor gets paid in forms that look like it's aligned with capital. So hedge fund managers get paid carried interest, which means that their labor income is dependent on the returns to shares that they manage but do not own. Or CEOs get paid in stock and stock options, which means that their income is partly dependent on the performance of their firms. But at the same time, that doesn't mean there isn't a massive conflict between elite labor and capital. Um, you know, hedge fund managers are taking their 2 and 20 out of the returns to capital of the owners of the assets that they manage. In a typical recent year, the five highest paid executives at the S&P 1500, so that is 7,500 people overall, took home as labor income 
10% of the profits of the S&P 1500. That's a non-trivial conflict between capital and elite labor. A typical investment bank today disperses half of its revenues after interest paid as wages to its professional employees. It's been a better 30 years to be a banker than an owner of bank stocks. So there is a real conflict between elite labor and capital. There's also, of course, a real conflict between elite labor and ordinary labor. If you look at management, one thing that elite labor has done is it's restructured the management function inside large American firms to strip managerial discretion from all workers other than itself. And if people are interested, I can talk about the history of how this has happened. But the result is that whereas the management function was dispersed across all of a firm's employees at mid-century, and therefore also the economic returns to management were widely dispersed across firm employees as wages, which is why a mid-century CEO made only about 20 times the median production worker. Today, the management function is concentrated in a very narrow cadre of elite executives, and the returns to management are concentrated in a narrow cadre of elite executives, which is why a CEO today makes about 300 times as much as the median production worker. So the conflict is real, and superordinate labor both extracts income from capital and from middle class labor. And that's the kind of story I want to tell, none of which is to deny that sometimes superordinate labor and capital are aligned, and capital's resurgence is consequential. And, and this is important and something to talk about maybe when we open this up, might become more consequential in the future. So, you know, Thomas Piketty's work about the increasing capital intensiveness of production and the increasing in wealth concentration among capitalists suggests that there's a dynamic at play whereby capital will become more dominant, more driven towards inequality, and more intensively involved in the economy going forward. Those forces can be real, and the forces that I'm describing can also be real. Both dynamics can be happening at once, and at some point they will compete on the margin of explanation. And the point at which they'll compete is when the elite that has produced this labor income dies and gives its income as bequests to its children. And how that plays out politically, sociologically, and economically is a, is a deep question about which I think no fair-minded person can have a great degree of certainty. Okay, so I, I'm going to pass on then from the descriptive just to, for, for lack of time. I mean, there's a ton there. I, I think it's worth raising not just kind of the view at the top, but the desire of some folks to really continue to organize their thinking around the traditional contest between capital, since there's still a lot of manufacturing and, and labor, and really think less about the, the so-called middle class and talk about the, the working class. But let's not do that. Can I say one more sentence Please, on this? Yeah. Just, and this is slightly snide, but I think it's important. Um, those who consume and propagate the traditional view that it's capital versus labor are mostly themselves superordinate workers <laughs> whose status and reputation depends on the institutions that I'm describing and criticizing. And uh, it's very tempting to say the problem is not us, right. whereas my view is that the problem is in substantial measure us. Okay, great. So let's get, let's get into that. So there, this isn't just a neutral description. I mean, it's even been called a kind of hectoring, <coughs> stern denunciation. Uh, and, and then the question is, on, on what moral principles is the denunciation occurring? So I, I see a lot in here. Um, there's, there is a kind of argument that, especially from the perspective of the dominated, the let's call them the middle class, um, there's class rule, and domination is objectionable. But it's not really the focus, although it, it certainly occurs in the book. There's, I would say uh, there's an interesting small R Republican concern about regime stability. And the suggestion is that from that moral perspective, this is an incredibly risky proposition. And Donald Trump, uh, not that you're you're defending the, the goal of making America great again in spite of a certain reviewer, but you're, you're explaining and wondering if uh, the country can last very much longer with this kind of class domination. But I think in this room we'll, we should really focus on the last um, moral, or one of the last moral 
perspectives, which is really a kind of sympathetic critique on behalf of superordinate labor of their of of their own uh, uh, alienation. And do you want to kind of spell out that argument? Not that they're objects of sympathy, the people in this room, uh, but that on your descriptive account, they're unhappy right. already. Right. And, and morally, they're right to right. Uh, hate their, their, their situation. Yeah, I think maybe just to, to preface this, to, to reemphasize something you said, it's important to distinguish between moral and political sympathy on the one hand and sort of existential sympathy on the other hand. Moral and political sympathy is the kind of ideal that gives people a reason in, let's say, in our society, in a democratic politics, to care about the fate of others and to make sacrifices to ease the problems of others. And there's no sense in which the excluded middle class or the increasingly um, really marginalized and, and deeply harmed lower middle class and working class has any reason to have moral or political sympathy for the elite. But existential sympathy is a different thing. It has to do with the question whether the lived experience of a social position in a certain constellation of forces is one that is flourishing for the purple person in it. Just explain right. that, because it seems like the elite could have moral sympathy for itself and resolve to shake the system. So, so I think, reason. yeah, so I'm, I'm uncomfortable saying even that, partly because, and this is the sort of Marxist component of the book, I, I want to resist moralizing as much as possible and talk instead about conditions of prospering and flourishing and structures and avoid judgments of entitlement or blame. Um, for a variety of reasons, both intellectual and political. But I also think, um, even if one is more tempted to this kind of moral thought, it remains the case that many people in the elite, uh, they could, at a kind of sacrifice, but one that is perfectly reasonable to expect people to bear, pull themselves out if, if they were wanted, if they were just willing to accept less status and less wealth, um, and to subject their children to greater risk but a risk of a sort that everybody else's children are always subjected to. So I just want to resist that, the, the moral sympathy. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, if you're a child born into this system, you probably took your first placement test at age two. You didn't know you were taking it, but your parents trotted you into some New York or Boston or San Francisco preschool where some people prodded you and decided whether you would get admitted or not. And your parents probably took you to 12 of these and you probably got into one. And that's what the numbers say. I'm not making this up. A lot of these schools have lower admissions rates than Harvard College. And you were then subjected to a regime where at each year in your life, vast resources were spent by your school, by your parents, by tutors, to try to squeeze as much human capital into you as possible. Um, deployed in a rigorously rationalized way. The schools study the psychology and sociology of education. They adjust their practices in order to teach as much as possible. Even play is purposive rather than just casual or hijinks. The idea is to push you ahead, evaluate you, sort you, look to the next step. And at every point, you're benefited by this, but you're also subjected to this kind of training. Uh, the competition is so stiff that while having this kind of education given to you is almost a necessary condition for success, it is very far from a sufficient condition. So there's constant risk of being pushed out of the elite, so there's enormous class anxiety at the top, which is an irony of this kind of a system. You know, the old aristocrats could pass on their privilege just by dying. The new aristocrats have to rebuild it in each generation. You go to college where what you study, how you study, and what you aim for is determined not by your private personal interests, but by a, an organized, sociologically cohesive sense of what will get you ahead. You go to graduate or professional school. You then take jobs where you work 80, 90 hours a week. And you continue to do that well into middle age. You know, somebody told me, and I can't say which firm it is, uh, but there is a major New York City law firm which has a database which keeps track of the billed and collected fees attributable to every partner. 
And there's an app on the partner's smartphones that they can use to check every, their own and everybody else's contribution to firm profitability. And that database is updated every 20 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And this is for partners making several million dollars a year who are subject to that kind of really dominating workplace manipulation and control of a sort that if any other worker were subject to with those hours under those conditions, labor lawyers would say this is a violation of basic labor rights. And of course, it's not because they're owners, not workers, and because they're getting paid two, three, four million dollars a year, but that doesn't change the human experience of it. The fundamental logic, and then I'll stop, is that wealth held as physical or financial capital frees its owners because they can mix their wealth with other people's labor, extract rents, and enjoy the returns. But wealth held as human capital, that is to say, as the accumulated training of the meritocrat, enslaves its owner. Because the only way to extract income out of your own human capital is to mix it with your own contemporaneous labor, directed according to the market rather than your personal values and preferences. And so in a sense, what this system does is it shifts the classic Marxist account of exploited and alienated labor up the class structure so that the middle class becomes the proletariat, really the lumpen proletariat. That is to say, it is deprived of meaningful work and caused by structural inequality to be unable to come into a class consciousness. And alienated and exploited later labor comes to roost in the elite. And that's the system that I think in substantial measure we have now. And notice that leaves everybody badly off. Okay, good. So there's, there's existential hell, alienated labor now at the top. And maybe there's political opportunity. I want to get there. But just so there, there is this empirical question whether those climbing the greasy rungs to existential hell in law firms, say the people in this room, are already unhappy. Right. You say they are. I read in the New Yorker. I happen. This is a quotation from the New Yorker magazine. I happen to know some current students and recent graduates of Yale Law School, and they don't seem diffident or despairing to me at all. In fact, they seem, understandably, rather pleased with themselves. <laughs> is, is, is this a, is first of all? Is it possible that you're wrong about our students and they just don't realize what lies right. so, in store for them? So uh, it's possible. Um, so I happen to know some of the same ones he happens to know, and, and I get different reports from them, but I'll leave that to one side for the moment. Right. Um, but um, look, uh, there is actually widespread data on this, and it's not just Yale Law School. Um, it is now the case that for example, uh, anxiety and depression are more diagnosed among children of professionals than in the population in general. Um, there was a high school in Silicon Valley, a high achieving elite high school in Silicon Valley that some psychologists from I think the University of St. Louis came in, in and did a study. Uh, according to that study, I think 54% of the students in that high school had moderate to severe symptoms of depression and roughly 80% had moderate to severe symptoms of anxiety. There is widespread learning, not just at this law school, but across universities, about the mental health effects of whatever it is that this is. I have a view about the causes, and obviously I can't demonstrate the causes, but of the mental health of elite student bodies, which has deteriorated dramatically by any reasonable measure. The study in this law school suggested I think 70% of respondents said that they felt the need to make use of mental health services. Um, so there is, a, I think, a broad empirical sense, not based on anecdote, that the problems I'm describing are widespread and widely felt. And taking that kind of data and setting it aside and just thinking narratively about the people I know at every stage in the system, the parents whose children are in the system, the undergraduates I know, the law students I know, the young lawyers I know, and the senior lawyers I know. This is not a picture of extravagant human flourishing that I see. And I could tell stories, and we can trade stories, but I think the main thing I, I invite people to do is to look 
to your, if you're in the elite, look to your left and right and introspect and ask whether you think that the people that you see are living the lives that they want to live, ought to want to live, and how they feel about their lives. And, and I think the picture that I tell is the one that will emerge. Of course, I could be wrong. Okay, so in my waning minutes, I just want to ask two questions about kind of remedies. What is to be done? Um, now, I'm kind of surprised by what you said earlier, because you, you said you're a structuralist. Uh, but then you, you said, well, the Marocrats could simply give up their reign. Yeah. Uh, and that matches a, an op-ed of the other day by Richard Reeves, who talks about your work and says, well, the, the, the rich could just choose... Yeah not to reproduce their gains uh, by drilling it into their children and, you know, over-scheduling them and resume-building them. Uh, but that just right. doesn't right. seem right. right. So you, if you're right. a structuralist, right. you think this is not happening through anyone's volition in particular, right. from which it follows that you can't just say, I'm not going to be part of the system. So, so by uh, what I said earlier, what I meant is for the purposes of apportioning moral sympathy, it is possible for elites to do this. Certainly somebody who's a partner at a large law firm and is making four or five million dollars a year and has done that for some number of years could, if she wanted to, insulate herself from her effort, insulate her children from the need to expend this kind of effort. And, and it may be that, that just the brute possibility of that, if you think of money as a relation of constraint and power, enough money frees you from those constraints in a way that nobody else is freed in a society of private property. And that may be enough to eliminate moral claims to sympathy. That's, that's the thought. But of course, money isn't the only kind of power. And the system that we live under is not simply one of an unequal distribution of money, income, and wealth. It's also one of social evaluation and economy of status and esteem an internal psychological and sociological dynamic that has been absorbed by the elites, a desire for dynastic privilege and transmission of privilege, which all parents have, not just elite parents. And uh, you know, an activist said to me a few years ago about this, that if you try unilaterally to pull out of this system, your whole world comes crashing down on your children. And that's an apt description of the sociology and psychology of it. And so in that sense, elites individually can't simply freely opt out. And uh, it's absurd to think that they can. And partly, here's the structuralism in it. Um, actually, uh, Bernard Williams once said to me about Hobbes. He said, the oddity about Hobbes and the state of nature is Hobbes imagines if you want to know what people are truly like, you put them into the most extreme, terrible position imaginable and see how they behave. But it seems like a more natural way to think about this is, if you want to know what people are truly like, ask what they're ordinarily like, what they're actually like, how people behave in the kinds of circumstances that they, in fact, inhabit. And <coughs> what we see is an elite that overwhelmingly does not pull itself out of this. And the elite is just as human as everybody else and no more cowardly or venal or shallow or childish. And the fact that nobody seems to be able to do this is overwhelming evidence that there's an important sense in which it's difficult to do, particularly if by difficult what you mean is the kind of difficulty that should be taken into account in generating social policy to reform structures of inequality and domination, rather than the kind of difficulty that maybe you might want to take into account if you want to get on your high horse and be a moralist, which is a different kind of thought. And it's the former that is the one that I think we should be focusing on if we actually want to improve the situation, not just for the elite, but also, very importantly, for the middle class and the working class. Okay, so last one. You, you do offer some remedies in the last bit of the yeah. book. We're not going to cover those that have to do in, with things like tax policy and uh, college admissions and so forth. It seems in, in some of the discussions I've heard from you, like the, there's an amazing podcast I listened to while exercising with Ezra Klein, which I think goes furthest um, in, in kind of remedies, because you, you basically say we, we need a new political economy in which we reskill those we've de-skilled in the middle or working class. And 
kind of ar arrange things so that hyperskilling is no longer right. needed at the top. Right. So again, as a structuralist, um, it's just not clear how, how that would work. Right. It seems as if we've had a transition from you know, a, a so-called Fordist way of organizing political economy to what we live in. And that's a, let's call that a knowledge economy. And why, why not think about kind of enlarging the vanguard, especially since, you know, a lot of these people who work hard are creators, uh, and we, we wouldn't want them to return to the old aristocratic right. indolence, right. even if they got their free time back to, right. you know, not be alienated. That seems like a much better remedy so, than kind of returning, not, not exactly, but kind of functionally, right. to an, a political economy with more fairly distributed skill and therefore outcomes. Well, so, I mean, this is significantly a place at which contingency comes into play. And a lot depends, I think, on the following question. How much of the bias in new technologies in favor of extravagant skills is necessary or essential or inevitable and favors technologies that actually have a high social product? And how much is contingent and favors technologies that actually have a low social product? So my view of technological innovation is that the nature of technological innovation is pervasively and fundamentally contingent that there is no reason to believe that innovation is biased towards complexity or towards favoring elite skills. The first industrial revolution favored unskilled workers over skilled workers. Today, innovation in economies like Germany's favors mid-skilled workers over super-skilled workers. And the book tells a series of case studies and includes also some economy-wide data that suggests that what has driven innovation to favor skills is this new supply of elaborately educated superordinate workers. And uh, if you want a cheap and therefore unfair, but nevertheless I find persuasive way of observing this, imagine setting loose on contemporary finance the lazy, untrained, totally unmathematical finance worker that dominated Wall Street in 1950. That person would have been completely unable to function at all in the financialized economy we have today. The reason we have the economy we have is that we have workers who can function in it. So that's the first point. The second point has to do with whether innovation is a good thing or not, or what kinds of innovation are a good thing. And, and here, look, if you look at management, if you look at law, if you look at finance, and these are fields that contribute a very high proportion of top 1% income households. These are fields in which there's been massive, dynamic, extravagant innovation in the past 30 years. And almost none of it has had a social product that's positive. If you look at contemporary finance, if you look at securitization, uh, the best work is by economists called uh, Philippon and Reshef. They suggest that modern style, high-tech finance is almost exactly as socially efficient as old style, low-tech finance was that the transactions cost of financial intermediation have gone neither up nor down, that the share of fundamental risk borne by the individual has gone neither up nor down. What we've done is we've replaced a finance system that used low technology methods dominated by mid-skilled workers, large numbers of them, with one that uses high-tech methods dominated by super-skilled workers, produces exactly the same social product, but concentrates the returns in the elite. I think the same thing is true of law. If you compare the US legal system to the German legal system, Germany has no elite law schools, no lawyers who have anything like the training or structural systematic population-wide creativity that our graduates do. It also has a legal system in which both the transactional side and the adjudicative side are structured in such a way that once a lawyer is competent, the additional returns to the client of more skill are very, very low. Whereas we have a system with a hierarchical form of legal education which trains an elite that's second to none, and at which every part of our legal system continues to reward lawyerly skill all the way up the skill distribution. And I think no sane person would think that our legal system is anywhere close to as socially productive as Germany's. So we have a lot of innovation whose social product is negative. Uh, I believe the same thing is true even of medicine, although that's a harder case to make.
But if I'm right about those things, that's why the kinds of solutions that I prefer are preferred. That is to say, they stop innovation that has a high private product and a low social product and encourage innovation that has a high social product and a low private product, which would make everybody better off.